Well, we started off this uh, morning kind of at the 30,000 foot level, and now we're really kind of focusing down a little more site specific with our final speaker. Uh, Dan Lambert is a conservation biologist and project leader with uh, High Branch Conservation Services, and they're out of Heartland, Vermont. His work focuses on building and coordinating conservation partnerships that put, actually put science into action. He is the founder and former coordinator of the Mountain Bird Watch and the Northeast Bird Monitoring Partnership. And since 2012, Dan has been working with VMC cooperators to create a place-based science and stewardship program for healthy mountain ecosystems. So Dan received his BA in environmental education from Dartmouth and got a master's in ecology at the University of Alberta. And with that, please welcome Dan Lambert. Thank you. Very pleased to be here today. I'm going to back this up a little bit, I think. The theme of this meeting benefiting from actionable science has had me thinking about what science is for and whether the natural sciences in particular ought to be expected to deliver benefits beyond building knowledge in order to justify our investment in them. Isn't it isn't there just intrinsic value in the process of wondering and observing and in that thrill of discovery and then afterwards just knowing? That certainly was the Greek philosopher Plato's view 2,400 years ago when he made the case that the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake was not just valuable, it was fundamental to who we are. And that idea had a strong influence on his student in blue there, Aristotle, who as many of you know uh, as the father of natural science because his classification of animals provided the intellectual framework um, that organizes much of the work that we do today. And so this idea, this appreciation for basic knowledge has stood up over all these centuries and it's easy to understand why. It's because we're curious and so we watch. And watching leads to discovery. Discovery is fun and that builds knowledge. Knowledge is pretty good, it's, uh, it's satisfying, but it's not as fun as discovery and so we ask new questions, um, never quite getting enough of that thrill. And this is not only how children learn, this is how some people make their careers following that cycle. Take this group of wires here from the University of California. They spent 100 minutes observing mating leeches, 10 pairs of mating leeches, and then they created a quantitative model of their sexual behavior. Now, before this study, we already knew a lot about leeches. We know that they have 32 brains. We know that they're hermaphrodites, so they've got boy parts and girl parts. And we know something about their sexual activity. They engage in a process called mutual fertilization. But thanks to this study, we now know that they spend about 85% of their time while mating just getting warmed up. You know, bodies touching, a little rest, some partner exploration, maybe a little locomotion, and only about 15% of their time copulating. I can say that, right? <laughs> um, so this is not actionable science unless you want to take lovemaking tips from leeches. <laughs> um, but it is pretty cool to have this understanding about animals that are even the least charismatic in our natural world. Charles Darwin knew something about the rewards of watching slimy things wriggle around. He spent 40 years observing worms in his garden and published his findings in a 350-page book called The Formation of Vegetable Mold by the Action of Worms. And one of his favored methods was to visit a field near him where some rocks uh, lay out in the pasture, and year after year, he would monitor the settling of those stones into the soil and the, the growth of the vegetation around them um, because he was interested in the turnover of the adjacent and underlying soil by this action of worms. So this, this observation, which continued over 29 years, um, would seem to be a relatively minor contribution to the 
to the annals of science, especially you know, compared to uh, the theory of evolution. But in fact, this repeated observation at a single location year after year just might hold the key for solving some of our 21st century global challenges. And today, biological field stations are sites where this continuous observation occurs. And these sites provide some good examples of translating science into action. So the Forest Service back in the 1950s put some precipitation um, uh, monitoring uh, instruments into the Hubberbrook watershed and they uh, installed these stream gauges which allowed Herb Borman, Gene Likens, and a number of their collaborators to monitor the elements that were coming into the watershed, the elements that were flowing out of the watershed, and creating a nutri nutrient budget. And this led to the discovery of acid rain. And their findings um, helped strengthen the Clean Air Act, especially the 1990 amendment, which resulted in dramatic reductions in uh, the emission of acids and um, also the deposition of acids in the Northeast. And so our four soils are healthier as a result of this. Um, there's less leaching of the base cations uh, from our soils and uh, some real um, benefits from, from action at that field station. Eutrophication experiments in the Experimental Lakes area in Ontario uh, helped uh, measure the effects of um, pollutants like uh, nitrogen and, and phosphorus and, uh, into our surface waters and helped establish a whole suite of water quality regulations throughout North America, including the Clean Water Act. Research at the Proctor Maple Research Center on tree physiology conducted by Dr. Perkins and others um, here in this room, I'm sure, uh, has um, generated information about uh, sugar maple health and sugaring practices that uh, promotes the health not only of sugar bushes but of this industry that has cultural and economic importance to the state, another application of science. And over in New Hampshire at the Bartlett Experimental Forest over the last 40 years or so, the work there has generated some really invaluable reference guides on how to manage northern hardwood forests for timber, wildlife, and other values. So field stations sustain ecosystems and their services by shaping policy and practice. The National Research Council appreciates the role of field stations and in the intellectual infrastructure um, here in the United States, and they published a report earlier this year focused on enhancing and sustaining field stations. And one of their statements, I think, is relevant to our work today. Field stations are national assets that are necessary to understand and protect our rapidly changing natural world. And that rapid change, of course, is underway in mountain environments. Mountain environments have feature a number of uh, qualities that make them especially uh, sensitive to environmental perturbations. And so permanent platforms like uh, those that exist on Mount Washington and New Hampshire and Sulphur Mountain and Alberta, Niwot Ridge, uh, which is in Colorado, provide um, uh, opportunity as sentinels of global change to monitor climate, phenology, atmospheric deposition, element flux, biodiversity, ecosystem services, and a variety of other indicators. And yet, these permanent platforms not only act as sentinels of change, they can be agents of positive change. And so I'm going to um, take a little trip around the world here and look at different mountain field stations and how they have contributed to positive change. Beginning with the volcano in Hawaii, the Mauna Loa Observatory, which has helped establish the most complete and compelling record of the increase in atmospheric dioxide um, over the last 55 years. This is known as the Keeling Curve. The zigzags uh, represent seasonal variations in concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but a very um, clear increasing trend over the last half century or so. And over that same period of time, um, on the far right end of this hockey stick graph, which was made famous if you saw an inconvenient truth, um, that same period of time, the temperature in the northern hemisphere has been increasing as well. And so the correspondence between the carbon dioxide emission, emissions or the atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide in time with this increase in uh, the temperature helps create this cornerstone um, that is summarized 
and periodic reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And these reports synthesize the best available information about the status of our climate and the effects of climate change on society and on the environment. And these reports provide the basis uh, for governments to reform emissions policies and address the climate change issue all around the world, and including in Spain, where there is a mountain biosphere reserve in the Sierra Nevada, um, and a global change observatory to, uh, to monitor indicators of change in that system. And they have a very comprehensive monitoring program. They've got about 10 different domains that they work in. Many of them correspond pretty closely to what uh, VMC is doing, uh, addressing climate, atmosphere, water, flora, and fauna, but I want to um, zoom in on a, a couple of their program areas in particular that I think relate to the actionability of science. They have a program in ecosystem services and socioeconomy where scientists and social scientists measure the erosion control and the water regulation benefits of these um, natural areas. Also the benefits to people uh, that they deliver in the form of economic opportunity, traditional uses, and they track uh, visitation levels and investment of the government into uh, natural resource activities within that biosphere reserve. They also have a, a, a separate program that deliberately attends to management evaluation. And so uh, they look at the effectiveness of management actions and they use their findings, their evaluation of management actions to then hold events to train decision makers on management and policy, policy issues. And so there's a reaching out um, from scientists to the policy arena. Um, at this Sierra Nevada station. And it's that same approach of partnership building and training that uh, the Sugadaira Montane Research Center and the Japanese Alps takes in their geo-environmental reclamation program. Now, this is a program that involves institutions all across the landscape, and that landscape level sort of uh, holistic focus is reflected right there in their, uh, in their logo. In fact, the mountains for a Montane Research Center, you'd think mountains would figure more prominently, but in fact, this um, logo represents the whole sweep of the landscape and really draws the connection, uh, the vital connection between the mountain and the waters. Now, people working in the Lake Champlain area have also uh, recognized that connection. Uh, logo in the uh, top left there is the Lake Champlain Research Institute from SUNY Plattsburgh. In the middle, it's the Middlebury College's um, research vessel on Lake Champlain. Of course, the Lake Champlain Basin Program here in the bottom right. And so. Um, it was, uh, I, I was pleased to see that this afternoon in the Mount Mansfield Science and Stewardship Conference we'll have uh, Bill Howland from the Lake Champlain Basin Program participating because he uh, clearly recognizes, as we must, as mountain stewards recognize the connection between lakes and waters. And a, a good reason to pay attention to what's happening in Japan is that not only do our logos look the same, but our mountains also have many very similar features. If you kind of squint, this kind of looks like maybe um, the Alpine area uh, in the uh, White Mountains. So mountain field stations don't just produce reclamation programs and uh, foster that exchange between science and policy. They're also nurseries for thought leaders. The Rocky Mountain Biological Lab um, or otherwise known as, as Rumble, has produced a, a number in this regard. Paul Ehrlich in the upper right there is the author of The Population Bomb. And his interest in human demography began when he studied uh, alpine butterflies in these meadows in the high country near Crested Butte, Colorado. Michael Sule, Michael Sule in the lower left was associate director of Rumble for a number of years uh, ending in the 19, early 1980s and just after he wrapped up that work he went out to um, publish a seminal textbook on conservation biology and founded the Society for Conservation Biology. And in the lower right there another Rumble alum is John Holdren who is President Obama's uh, policy advisor. And I like to think that he draws inspiration from his time at this station as he leads the president's uh, program to address climate change issues and to uh, ward off attacks, uh, that uh, political attacks that attempt to, um, to degrade the, the scientific basis for addressing climate change. 
I just have to pause here and see if anybody else has noticed the trend in facial hair design. Um, are these guys too busy thinking to shave or what? How about these guys? It's a trend that transcends the ages, I guess. All right. Throughout North America, there are 400 field stations and marine laboratories. And yet, only a handful of those occur in mountain um, settings. A number of them are in valleys, but if you're talking about high elevation field stations, uh, it's, it's a fairly short list. And in the Northeast, the only observatories uh, that occur in the high, high country are uh, focused on meteorology above tree line. And so, um, I hope you see a, an opportunity here, because um, those field stations in North America are beginning to network globally with other mountain field stations. A number of them assembled this past July at a global fair and workshop for mountain observatories out in Reno, Nevada. And this is a depiction of the personal and professional relationships that were established or renewed at that meeting. And these kinds of uh, connections reinforce data sharing connections. And there are half a dozen or more international um, data sharing programs that go by the names of Geonome and Gloria and Summit, uh, Global Mountain Biodiversity Assessment, the Mountain Invasion Research Network, and International Mountain LTERs, Long-Term Ecological Research Sites. So there's an opportunity